Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, um, my name is Nicolas Seidler. I'm the director of the Geneva Science Policy Interface. Uh, and I have the great pleasure uh, to welcome you all to this conference that will discuss uh, the use of drones in the context of uh, humanitarian work. Uh, so, as you'll see, a very future-oriented discussion in a very uh, historic uh, building of Unibastion. Uh, I would like to start by uh, thanking our partners for this event, uh, the uh, University of Geneva, of course, uh, We Robotics, uh, and SwissNext Boston. Uh, thanks already to our distinguished moderator, Chris, uh, Christian Sim, CEO of SwissNext Boston. Thanks to our speakers, Patrick Meyer, uh, CEO of We, We Robotics, Professor Giovanna Di Marzo uh, from the University of Geneva, and uh, Ms. Ivana Nadi from uh, UNHCR, uh, the High Commission on uh, Refugees. Um, at a broad level, tonight's discussion is going to be about how technology can help us uh, humans address uh, key current global challenges, including health, the environment, uh, and forced displacement. But as we know, technology is not inherently a positive or threatening force. A lot of it depends on how, uh, what we decide to do with it and how we as a society decide to integrate it uh, in our lives and societies. As a case in point uh, of this duality of technology, uh, the use of drones uh, has seen a remarkable evolution over the past few years. Originally used mostly for military applications, drones have become much more present in our societies. You've probably seen drones uh, used by photographers or videographers uh, in Geneva or elsewhere. I would even bet that many of you will have a drone under the Christmas tree uh, this winter. And who knows, maybe tomorrow you might get uh, delivery of your next online shopping experience directly to your door uh, or window for that matter. But there is much more to this and the use of drones uh, in terms of social impact, uh, in particular in low-income countries. There is an increasing number of NGOs, UN agencies, and other actors who are using this very same technology to support life-saving actions. Drones are now used to deliver and retrieve blood samples to remote areas. Drones can support efforts of disaster relief professionals in case of earthquakes or other natural disasters. And drones can also gather life-improving data on climate change, agriculture, or urban development, just to name a few. Today we have the privilege to hear hands-on stories, uh, thanks to the presence again of Patrick Mayer, uh, CEO of We Robotics. We Robotics is an NGO which mission is to develop sustainable local solutions for the use of drones in low-income countries to address some of the challenges I have mentioned, including aid, health, develop, development, and environmental efforts. We will also have the chance to have uh, the perspective from distinguished panelists from the worlds of academia and uh, international organizations. Academia because uh, scientists not only play an essential role to develop some of the underlying core technologies that fuel such innovations, but also because academia has a role in making sure that we have a better understanding of the impact of these technologies on, uh, and how best to leverage them uh, for the benefit of, of society. International organizations, because we find they are both users of the technology to advance their missions, as we'll hear today in the case of uh, refugees, uh, but also because there are policy and regulatory considerations when promoting but also setting boundaries about the use of drones. So this bridge between science, policy, practice is really at the core of uh, the mission of the Geneva Science Policy Interface, uh, which I represent. And our objective is really to um, help ground policies and practices in scientific evidence and on the other hand, uh, um, uh, promoting the social impact of scientific research. Having said that, I will now uh, hand over to Christian Sim, uh, who will moderate uh, tonight's event. 
Uh, Christian is uh, the founder and former CEO of Swissnext uh, San Francisco uh, and the current CEO of uh, Swissnext Boston. Uh, he's a self-described recovering physicist, uh, always scouting uh, for next, uh, the next innovation. Um, and he has also been uh, recognized as one of Switzerland's uh, top 100 digital shapers in 2018, uh, as is the case of uh, Professor uh, Di Marzo as well. Uh, so handing over uh, to you, uh, Christian, uh, and wishing you all a very interesting and fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nicola. Um, oh, that's very shiny here. Uh, <laughs> I, I barely see you, just as a, so that you know. But, but let's make a, a, um, a count just to get an idea of of whom we have here in the room. That will also help to inform uh, the panelists. So who here actually owns a drone? One, two, three. OK, not, not too many. Uh, who here can tell me at least 10 uses of a drone? Only one. Oh, OK, one. Well, just for your information, MIT just released a report about six months ago where they, they listed, I believe it was 157 currently commercial uses for, for drones, you know. They do all types of things. Of course, the packages that Nicola mentioned is one thing, but one of the big applications of drones, just as an intro, is actually agriculture. You know, if, if you're a farmer and you have a huge field that's two miles by two miles, how do you know if in the center of your field actually everything is fine? So before you flew a helicopter or you flew a plane over it, which is, of course, extremely expensive and two needs very well-trained people. Nowadays, you can use a drone that you program before it leaves and it comes back by itself, brings you back the images. This is a technology that has been used now. Uh, it's an interesting evolution by, uh, by the government of Tanzania to map uh, the islands of Zanzibar. And not only do, did they use a technology that's really cheap, uh, that is very efficient, it is actually very easy to transfer as a knowledge to the local people. And so the people they chose to, to be the professional pilots are actually students from the University of Zanzibar. So the first professional drone pilot in Africa, and her surname is the Drone Queen, is actually a young woman. She's now about 20, 21. Um, and, uh, and for her, in particular, also in a, in a very Muslim country, it was an incredible case of empowering, empowering the, um, the local population. But drones are used in all types of other things, and you know, rescue and inspection and all these things. But today, we, we're going to focus on drones in the humanitarian sector. And, and why is this interesting? And maybe you, you guess it already. You know, Everyone has a little piece of humanitarian in ourselves. We would all like to, to go out there and help. And sometimes you actually create more problems by doing that than you solve problems. And there's a number of things that have to be examined. But also, what does it really need? What sort of, what sort of um, safeguards do you need? What sort of regulations? But also, what can you actually do? One of the big questions you'll hear discussed today is, what can we actually really achieve with drones? And by the way, the drone, we have to be careful in saying that, the drone is, in the conversation of today, is not the flying thing. Actually, it's not that, it's not that is really interesting, is what you can do with it. And what you can do with what the drone captures. So that's why we're also going to talk a lot about, about AI and computing and, and these type of things tonight. So this is, uh, this is uh, the, the subject. I think it's, it's, very, it, it's a very good place to do that in Geneva, you know, with that incredible concentration of international organizations we have here and all the brain power that Switzerland has. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but in Switzerland we have about 88 zero startups in the drone field. We are considered for interesting reasons. Uh, you know, nobody really knows why. I mean, you can guess why there is so many startups, but we are one of the leading nations in the world in, in the variety of applications of drones, from the leading company for drones in show business 
to the company that produces these drones to fly over Zanzibar. Um, so we are, we, we are, we are a, an epicenter for the conversations on that. And of course, with all these international organizations in Geneva, there was no better place to have that conversation tonight. Well, with that introduction about uh, the subject of tonight, uh, I think there is no better way to bring you deeper into the subject by inviting Patrick Meyer to, uh, to the floor. Um, Patrick, he always wears a hat, so we can ask him later why. But he's actually really very famous for having bridged and continuing to bridge the world of the humanitarian world and the world of the technology. So the digital humanitarian, that's actually, I think, a, a term that you like to use. And he's going to give us a few examples of what world is actually opening up with that technology that is not going to go away. We just have to be aware of that. Patrick, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Christian. Thank you for your, your kind introduction and, and uh, warm welcome. And thank you all. I know how busy everyone is, uh, so many other things to do. And so thanks for uh, choosing to spend part of your evening uh, with us today. There's a, a lot to uh, really be said in this space, and uh, there's only so much time. Um, so I've uh, selected a few examples that are really important to me uh, personally uh, that I wanted to share uh, with you. I think what we're, we're seeing is that robotics is starting to reshape uh, humanitarian space, development, environment. It's just early signs, mind you. Huh? It's not the full wave just yet. But I think these uh, early signs are, can be quite insightful, not only in terms of, not in a deterministic way, oh, these are the signs and this is the way it's going to happen, but uh, early signs to help us ask question, what kind of world do we actually want to live in as well? There is there's human agency here uh, involved. It's not just uh, technology. I, um, I'm here with my co-founder, by the way. So Sonia, can you raise your hand? In case after during the discussions, there are two of us here. Um, before I jump in, maybe just to provide a bit of context, I've really been very fortunate to having been involved in what I consider are really exciting uh, humanitarian technology projects over the past uh, 15 years or so, really working with incredible organizations and potentially even more importantly, incredible individuals within those organizations. And I've done my best to try and, and share those firsthand experiences um, in, in a book. Um, that shares what we learned, the failures we uh, inevitably uh, faced, and, and uh, how we continued moving forward and, and so on. And I think because um, of where we are here now in, in Switzerland, it's actually quite special. And just to echo what Christian um, just said, not only is the international humanitarian community and the international community headquartered here in, in Switzerland, but there are 80 other reasons that we are here uh, as we robotics. Um, there is a heck of a lot going on. This is a, a really exciting, innovative industry, a, a thriving uh, industry here in Switzerland on the hardware side, on the software side, and so on. And we're just really, really pleased to get the opportunity to be a, a contributing uh, member of this, uh, of this ecosystem to help accelerate the transfer from uh, the hardware, the software, to others uh, around, around the world. And that's really a reason why I think you know, robotics, at some point, uh, is something I need, I'm going to need to write a whole book about on, on its own, um, because it's starting to change things in, in, in really interesting ways. And what I want to do now is really ground it and share, again, firsthand experiences of, uh, in using this technology, uh, just like I did in, in, in my book, and to kind of bring you to where we were when disasters hit and, and what happened. And so I thought I'd start with uh, this uh, satellite image of a, of a massive cyclone. This was not just a Category 5 cyclone. This was a high-end Category 5 cyclone that, that devastated the islands of the South Pacific. And as a result, the, this was in 2015, by the way. Um, and as a result, the World Bank asked me to coordinate their, what was at the time, their first humanitarian drone mission to try and speed up the relief efforts. Now, why drones? Well, if you look at this photo, there's only so much damage that you can actually see. Um, you can't really see and find all the displaced families. Um, from the air, 
A drone can take thousands of photos like this one, and, and, and very quickly. Photos that can help us assess the damage and to count all of the displaced families, because as we all know in the humanitarian space, the, the faster we can uh, assess the situation, the faster we can uh, assist. Uh, for example, like this family of five whose home was destroyed by the cyclone. This is where I started getting frustrated, um, sharing these stories, even though it was three years ago. Here I was in the Pacific, and there were no local drone pilots at all. Um, they just, there weren't any. Uh, so what we had to do was hire foreign drone companies to come in and do these aerial surveys. But these companies took weeks to deploy, and even when they were here on site, they didn't really know the local language. They didn't really know the local culture. Culture is important when you bring in an emerging technology. Um, didn't really understand the customs, the terrain, and so on, which inevitably slowed them down further, which then really begs the question, what the heck are we doing using drones supposedly for rapid response? It just you know, doesn't work. Now, you know, we did what we could, uh, 100 flights. It was all, frankly, between us, just, it was late. It was very, very uh, little use uh, and added value of, of doing that. Now let's fast forward. That was in 2015, and as we all know, uh, humanitarian disasters are becoming more frequent. They're becoming more powerful. Uh, climate change is obviously driving uh, a lot of this. At, and I think the Global Humanitarian Outlook uh, report actually just came out uh, earlier this week, and as we see again, uh, you know, where the humanitarian community is spending some $25 billion a year to help those affected by crises, to help people who are really, really in, in dire straits. And as the UN has noted, you know, that $25 billion a year is actually $15 billion short of what's actually needed to really take, uh, bring life-saving supplies and, and, and literally save lives and, and, and reduce suffering. So that's the picture, right? That's whether we like it or not, that is, that is the picture. Now, meanwhile, or in parallel, we also know that the rise of AI and robotics is powering the next industrial revolution, which means that this is enabling individuals to become radically more efficient, more efficient than ever, ever before. But here's the problem with this picture now. Uh, the fact of the matter is there's still very few, very few local experts who actually know how to use these technologies, know how to take advantage of these technologies for humanitarian efforts, for public health, and any other applications for that matter. And that really is, frankly, the nature of industrial revolutions. We've seen the previous industrial revolutions. They absolutely do create divides between those who have access to the new opportunities and those who don't. And this is absolutely true of this so-called fourth industrial revolution. I mean, I've just given you a picture of the Pacific where there were no local drone pilots, but it takes a very expensive foreign drone company to come in three weeks too late wanting business class tickets and staying at a five-star hotel. That's just not how we're going to manage the future of humanitarian disasters. It's just not ever going to work. So this is where we come in, our, our not-for-profit organization. We Robotics, what we're looking to do is really, lack of a better word right now, hack, hack this industrial revolution by creating more local opportunities uh, for these local experts to be engaged and be involved. Experts like like Amrita Lal. Amrita is a professional certified drone pilot who leads our flying labs in the South Pacific. And our flying labs are local uh, knowledge hubs uh, across the world that are run entirely by local professionals who we train, equip, and support if need be. More and more of these uh, entrepreneurs and, and local professionals are starting to experiment and, uh, in fact, even teach themselves on how to use uh, this, uh, this kind of technology. And, and this year, so three years after my own rather frustrating experience in the Pacific, another cyclone uh, hit the, the islands, this time in Fiji. But this time, Amrita was the one who was asked to support the relief efforts. Why? Well, because she's local, because she has a local knowledge, and frankly, she was able to deploy in a matter of hours and literally jump in that helicopter uh, with the Red Cross to start doing aerial surveys of the assessments matter of hours, not days, not weeks, hours. And it's because she's local that she and her team are still there now, working on other humanitarian and health projects. And so by, by joining the Flying Labs Network, these really incredibly hardworking, passionate, committed local experts gain the skills, 
gain the leadership opportunities, gain the career opportunities to follow their dreams and, and, and help local communities through the use of emerging technologies. Now, flying a drone, as those of you might have already done, uh, that's, that's just the first step. That, frankly, is the easy bit. Uh, far more difficult is how to coordinate humanitarian drone missions when all hell breaks loose. How do you communicate effectively with air traffic control while the folks in the military who control the airspace want your time liaising with governments who need answers and then humanitarian organizations who are doing what they, what they need to try and do. That's not easy and that doesn't come naturally to, to anyone. Or how to engage meaningfully with local communities. You know, I often say I don't care if you have legal permission to fly. That doesn't give you ethical permission to fly. Engaging local communities is not a, a nice to have. It's absolutely essential. And following the codes of conduct that inform how best to do that is really, really key as well. And then knowing how to analyze all the data that inevitably you're collecting. It's all a means to an end. You're not just flying the drone for the sake of flying the drone. You're trying to collect data. You're trying to affect change. So now how do you take this, all this data, all this imagery, and inform decision makers in a timely manner? That, all of that is a heck of a lot harder than learning how to fly a drone. And that's precisely why we're training Amrita and her team uh, on how to do all this safely, responsibly, and effectively. And I mentioned the data part. Uh, this is becoming harder. It's no longer, oh, uh, you know, a matter of not being able to find local drone pilots. That's starting to change through this global network of flying labs that we're building. Now what we're realizing is finding the local remote sensing experts who can start analyzing all this data because just to put it in perspective, um, aerial uh, data is a big data challenge. With a, a single 20-minute flight with a drone, you can capture some 800 high-resolution images. And according to Texas A&M, at least three years ago, uh, Texas A&M University, it takes a professional analyst about a minute to analyze each of these images. So with a 20-minute flight, you need somebody out there to have somehow 13 hours to be able to make sense of all this imagery, count all the damaged buildings, and, and, and so on. Because ultimately, what humanitarian organizations really don't want is just more po pictures, more photos. That, that's not what they want. They don't have the time to look at your photo. They want concrete answers to, to, to concrete uh, questions, right? Such as the percentage of destroyed buildings in a particular area, the, the number of damaged, uh, 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 partially damaged buildings, the number of displaced families, uh, and so on. Or like we were asked by the uh, World Bank, uh, to be able to assess the impact of uh, the latest cyclones on food security, which means uh, obviously we know local communities around the world are obviously very dependent on local crops that they usually uh, plant themselves and so on. And what do you do when a cyclone just uh, barrels through and then all of a sudden you no longer have your crops? I mean, that is a, a really serious food security uh, situation. So how are we going to assess the impact of the cyclones on, on food security, well, that actually starts uh, to mean that you have to uh, start counting palm trees, for example. It's a really important uh, uh, crop for, for local uh, communities, and not only in the South Pacific, and in, in, in the Philippines and other places, tropical places around the world. And counting uh, coconut trees uh, is not as easy as you would think, and, and it's um, incredibly time consuming. It's again, this 13 hours of manual analysis. So what we decided to do earlier this year is build a coalition around uh, what we're calling open AI uh, challenges with many other organizations. Um, there are still more that really uh, deserve credit here um, and that I'll speak to about a bit more, but like for example, Spatial Collective, a phenomenal uh, NGO in Kenya that's been making all of this possible in, in really big ways. So what we decided to do is say, you know what, let's put it out to the crowd. Let's challenge the crowd of data scientists to help develop algorithms, use AI, uh, machine learning, computer vision, to start automating some of these uh, processes. So that when Amrita and team go out and they start collecting literally thousands and thousands of aerial photos like this one, they don't have to spend the next 13 hours or three weeks, frankly, uh, counting all of these uh, coconut trees and, and comparing how many are still standing compared to before the cyclone, because it gets old really quickly. Nobody wants to do this for hours and hours on end. And that's why we've been partnering with these different organizations to build open AI solutions to enable Amrita and team to run these algorithms automatically and literally count every single you know, uh, coconut tree that happens to be on this part of the island. That kind of legibility uh, is really new. It's not something that we could necessarily do that quickly locally uh, before. The technology wasn't there, the software, the AI solutions. So it's, 
it's, it's, it's, a, it's a whole new set of opportunities for Amrita and her team to, to offer to humanitarian organizations and, and national disaster management organizations. And also what uh, ETH, by the way, was one of the winners of this challenge, ETH Zurich, they also came up with this really neat um, uh, visual where you're just dragging the cursor around and the algorithm will automatically tell you what kind of crop. And of course, one of the reasons I'm actually sharing this is this can happen in real time on the drone itself. You can imagine that this is a drone that's actually flying and doing this kind of automated detection. Once you have the algorithms, then, then you, know, you can do this kind of work in, in real time. And we're also really excited. I put Pictera there. This is a new uh, Swiss startup out of EPFL who are really helping to democratize AI solutions. You can, even me, who doesn't know how to code any of this stuff, I can go on the Pictera platform, upload my imagery, and create my own algorithms just by tracing and dragging and clicking. Uh, it's really enabling all our flying labs now, those who need access to the AI solutions, to, to have access. And it's really now allowing them to then also offer other services um, that they couldn't offer before on, on the data side. So I've talked about one, one project. I mentioned that Amrita and her team are also working on health projects. Um, as I think we all know, mosquitoes are a bit of a problem, uh, to put it lightly, uh, all around the world. And what we've seen over decades is a number of different interventions, uh, bed nets and other options. And, and nothing has really worked um, very, very well. Uh, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't continue doing them because it's obviously much better than nothing. They, it's obviously saving lives, but there's still a, there's still a challenge. And we had the good fortune of uh, starting a conversation with this phenomenal group that I think is now, as of like today or tomorrow, uh, out of stealth mode. Um, a group called the World Mosquito Program, WMP. And it's got some serious funding from Gates Foundation and, and USAID. And, and what they figured out is that there is a bacteria, a naturally occurring bacteria, called Wolbachia, um, that if you actually uh, infect, I don't know if that's the right word, uh, mosquitoes with this naturally occurring uh, Wolbachia bacteria, it prevents those mosquitoes from transmitting anything, like dengue, Zika, and so on. Uh, and the bonus is that these uh, Wolbachia mosquitoes will then meet other non-Wolbachia mosquitoes and share their Wolbachia with these other mosquitoes. And so you can see how it propagates. Uh, you're not killing the mosquitoes, you're just making them a lot friendlier to, uh, to us, uh, us humans, right? And now, I've been told not to show this picture because apparently it's not how it works. Um, so don't get me in trouble. This is, there's another method, just look it up, Wolbachia, it's complicated, I don't really get it, but it works. And in fact, it works so well that Google, uh, uh, you might not know this, but Google has been releasing millions upon millions of Wolbachia mosquitoes in California to start preventing the increased incidence of, of Zika in the state of California, which, by the way, is also somewhat connected to climate change because warmer areas, mosquitoes are gravitating further and further north. So it's now uh, you know, all nice and well to be doing this in California. You've got your nice Mercedes van. You've got the mosquitoes in the back. You've got beautiful roads. It's flat. It's a beautiful day. Frankly, easy. Now let's go back to where Amrita lives. This is a good road in rural areas. It's actually usable. You can still get through pretty slowly, but you, you can still get through. You're still being uh, held up a little bit. This is not Highway 1 down from uh, San Francisco to, to LA, right? And then what happens when those cyclones hit? Even if you've got tarmac roads, forget it. And, and let's continue that logic. It rains, it pours, pools of standing water, what happens next? That's, that's exactly when those mosquitoes breed, right? So this is exactly when you want to be releasing these mosquitoes to reduce the, the, the incidence of dengue in, in, the case of, in the case of Fiji. And also, reality check, uh, not all of us, uh, I don't know how to phrase it, get to live next to a road. There are a lot of very remote communities, obviously not only in the South Pacific, but the world over. So how do you include them in these public health interventions? Why don't they have the right to get equal access to public health interventions. And even if the roads do exist, by the way, uh, they're not like New York City, right? It's not uniform. So you're not actually releasing the mosquitoes in the most uh, effective way possible. Uh, you're just having to follow the infrastructure. So this gave us an idea uh, already, frankly, a couple of years ago. We've been working on this um, quite, quite a while. And by the, by the way, the main engineering team that's been working on this at We Robotics is in Bern. So if you ever want to pay them a visit, um, 
they're, they're really awesome people. They're hilarious. They work so hard. They pull all-nighters, and they really get it done. So open invitation to visit the, uh, the engineering team. And basically, we, what we decided is, you know what? Where, where we're going, we just don't need roads. We shouldn't need roads. We shouldn't have to depend on uh, infrastructure and so on. And by the way, you're the first folks outside of Weave Robotics and uh, our colleagues in Fiji to see this picture. It was literally taken 24 hours ago. Um, so what you see here is a drone, and underneath is uh, the release mechanism. What we've been able to do is pack in 50, 60, 70,000 of these Wolbachia mosquitoes very, very comfortably. They need to be comfortable. Um, and we can release them at any given amount of time, uh, or, or we can release like 200 every 100 meters if we want. We developed all the software for it. It talks directly to the drone. We, we can really control something. Uh, quite spectacular, and, and just to really give uh, full credit here to, to the engineering team, this is, all of this has been anything but trivial. As it turns out, mosquitoes are incredibly deadly, but they're also incredibly fragile, and they get hurt very, very easily, and uh, uh, if you injure a mosquito, that's it. That mosquito is no longer your team. It's, it's not going to uh, propagate Wolbachia and, and, and help you out. So you have to be very, very gentle with these mosquitoes, and when you think about putting 50,000 mosquitoes in a box, if you just do that, uh, they'll kill each other. They'll just shred each other. Uh, you actually have to have a cooling mechanism in a way to kind of tranquilize or uh, get them a little stoned and, and relaxed and comfortable so that they just sit there quietly until it's their turn to uh, jump out uh, the release mechanism. And just to make it more difficult, if it, as if it weren't even challenging enough, you have to figure out what is the optimal height to ensure that as the mosquito, when, these, when, they, when they fly out, they're, they're, they're dropping like a stone. I mean, they, they are, they're stoned, they're asleep, uh, you know, they're kind of half, half awake, half asleep, they don't know what's going on, they're just falling. And if you're too low altitude, <laughs> the mosquito goes flat, and that mosquito is not going to help you either, right? So you, you have to take into consideration weather, uh, altitude, and so on. And just over the past few weeks, and this is a, a really a, a world first, um, and by the way, this is where the mosquitoes come out of. That's where they jump out. Um, by the end of uh, well, mid-December-ish, um, the team there will have released uh, about a million mosquitoes. Never been done anywhere else in the world. And the, there's already some signs that this is already a lot more effective than the uh, uses of vans or, or, or cars. Because what they've done is, I don't know how they do this, huh? They've, added yellow powder to the mosquitoes that are released by the drone, right? So then they also have mosquito traps, and they can tell where those mosquitoes end up you know, flying. And already we can tell with these mosquito traps and the yellow powder that it's far more uniform, far more spread out than when you do this by road. And just to take it you know, up a notch, we can do, you know, we can do in half a day of, of, of drone flights, two drone flights, what it takes the World Mosquito Program team four days to do by road. And when we upgrade next year to a different drone platform, we'll be able to do in two hours what it takes them four days to do. That's where you scale, right? And let's just remember, this is not being driven by Google, by some person in Silicon Valley. This is Amrita and her team who are the local leaders here, who are the ones who are operating, piloting, this new approach to reducing dengue fever. That's what it's all about. And just to give you, you know, I give you these two examples. They're not just it. Um, we're also growing and building a global network of labs around the world, labs that use aerial, marine, and soon terrestrial robotics uh, with AI to solve humanitarian health development and environmental challenges. So, these are not just dots on a the map. There are very real people like Amrita, and I can, 60, 70 professionals who we get to work with around the Flying Labs Network who are incredibly hardworking, who use these technologies to make a difference in their own countries. So again, not just dots on a map. And just to give you an example, the Peru Flying Labs team has been using affordable cargo drones to deliver essential medicines like vaccines to very remote villages. In this particular case, this was already two years ago, uh, they delivered uh, anti-venom to a village in 35 minutes. The alternative is by, can by canoe, and it takes six hours. So if you've been bitten by a snake in the Amazon, what do you want to do? You want to wait for the drone, or you want to wait for the canoe? Right? Hopefully a rhetorical question. Uh, so really changing the way that potentially last-mile delivery services are, are done. 
In Nepal, the team has been working with Medair, a Swiss uh, humanitarian organization, to create high-resolution 3D models to really assess the risk of, of landslides uh, that are affecting a lot of the families uh, around those, those regions. In Tanzania, the team's been using drones to improve uh, agriculture, to help improve forecasting models for uh, harvest forecasting uh, and, and so on. And in the oceans, the team, oh, by the way, this is Khadija, who uh, Christian just mentioned. Um, the, in the oceans, the teams have been using underwater robots to assess the impact of climate change uh, on reef life, on coral reefs. And again, we can't, we, we can't protect what we can't count. So using the combination of these robotic solutions and AIs is, is really, really important. And what's also really fascinating for us, being, being a small team, is that these flying labs train each other as well. They share best practices and lessons learned. They even incubate each other. We have regional labs that will incubate affiliate labs in their regions, and they build ecosystems that connect key actors in government, in industry, and, and other sectors. And like I said, we're a small not-for-profit. We're, we're just nine. Um, but thanks to the support, obviously, of donors like the Rockefeller Foundation, and uh, Hewlett Foundation, Autodesk Foundation, and others, we've been able to build the core infrastructure to enable these flying labs to become more and more self-sustaining, which is really what's enabled us to build this global network of labs in, in uh, now 20 countries in just two short years. And it's not, um, it's, all, it's all locally demand driven, right? So we, folks from Benin got in touch with us. Uh, they wanted to uh, you know, join the Flying Labs Network, have a Benin Flying Labs Network. Then they introduced us to their colleagues in Burkina Faso. And they said, wait, well, hey, we want to be part of the Flying Labs Network as well. New opportunities, training, uh, project opportunities, and so on. And it just, it just grows uh, that way. And so what we want to be able to do, obviously, I think, um, is to help continue meeting this growing demand uh, and help support potentially a network of hundreds of labs uh, doing thousands of projects and improving the lives of, of millions. And, and all of this is done through partnerships. So just a, an open invitation here um, to, to, to partner, to team up uh, with us. We have the models. We have the partnerships with industry. Uh, if you're passionate, if you've already been working in a particular country or you know some local change makers uh, in those countries that could really benefit from being connected to a global network like the Flying Labs Network, then definitely please, please do get in touch. I'm going to end now on um, when things don't go well, I suppose. I don't know if I should have ended on that, but, um, but it's a reality, and there's no point trying to say it, it, it isn't. So all our Flying Labs follow an established uh, code of conduct that is... Uh, an excerpt or a summary of a broader uh, code of conduct called the Humanitarian UAV uh, Code of Conduct. It's been put together by dozens and dozens of, of humanitarian organizations around the world. It's, it's become the, the, it's kind of the, the guiding light uh, to inform the responsible and effective use uh, of drones. All of these organizations have, have participated. So we were pretty happy about this, you know, uh, that we're finally finding ways to hold ourselves accountable and to have best practices and so on. And then, of course, uh, reality hits you in the face. Uh, this is a satellite image of central Nepal 35 minutes before a major 8.0 earthquake struck the country. And to make matters worse, by the way, the, uh, that region of Nepal remained cloudy for, for the rest of that week, in fact. So forget using satellite imagery to do any kind of assessment. Within about 24 hours, I was asked by, the, by UN OCHA to coordinate the humanitarian drone response to uh, this effort. And goodness gracious, was that not fun. Um, I can go on for hours, but I'll just keep it very short. You had a number of startup drone companies, and frankly, most of them from Silicon Valley, deciding that because they were the experts in the technology, they would be the experts in the humanitarian response. So a lot of these companies, startups, self-deployed to Nepal, having never worked in humanitarian efforts, not speaking a word of uh, the local languages, uh, know, knowing the culture, the customs, and, and so on. And it was a complete disaster. Uh, they should have stayed home. Uh, if, you know, we say, you know, do no harm, but uh, holy cow, that's not something that they were even familiar with. They're humanitarian principles, they're not, you know, not something they're, they're, they're very conversant in. So that was very difficult, and I felt really, really crushed. I felt incredibly angry. Um, because I had sent the code of conduct to each of these organizations, these companies, 
bother looking at it. They were too busy taking selfies and saying, hey, children, literally, hey, children of Nepal, we're here to come and help you. Um, not my cup of tea, to say the least. And for me personally, I mean, my two other co-founders have different um, motivations as well and, 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 and frustrating experiences that they've uh, had in their fields. This for me was like, you know, enough is enough. I, I've had it. I, this, is, this, is, this is not the way it's going to happen. We need to build local capacity and so on. Um, and it is just the last couple minutes here. I wanted to share a tweet I saw from a colleague of mine just this week uh, who was reflecting uh, after uh, being involved in a humanitarian technology project. And he's saying the value was not in the application of the new technology itself, but rather in the impetus to question what we do, why we do it, and how we could do it better. So ultimately, the value of the drones in Nepal in this middle of the earthquake, the big revelation for me was not the drone, was holy cow, this is wrong, we need to build local capacity, because I never want to be in this situation again. I want to work with local Nepali pilots who uh, have uh, an understanding about what their country is about and, and speak the local language and so on. So the codes of conduct on its own, they're not going to solve everything. You need to build local capacity. And we're really proud to say that Nepal Flying Labs turned out to be our very first uh, flying labs. So really, in conclusion, because I've been asked to reflect at the end of the year, it's been about three years now that Sonia and I and the whole Flying Labs network have been working. Uh, so just really, if you, if you just let me another, another minute. Um, and I don't know how to put this. Uh, uh, um, I, I am, I am, there are many smart people in the world, top-notch engineers, really hard-working engineers, and others, uh, bankers, private sector, you name it. There are very many, many smart, smart people. And uh, I've just come to a point personally where I am, I am less and less impressed by, by smart people and, and more and more impressed by kind people. Um, I, I, I just can't tell you how much more happy, and uh, we are happy when we get to work with partners like Swissnex, like the university, kind people. Um, you know, there's a pro I was born and raised in Africa. There's a proverb, an African proverb that says, you know, if you, want to, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And going together with other kind people will get you even, even further. GPS coordinates of your birthplace should obviously not dictate the options you have in life. Just because by act, we're all, it's all accidental that you know, we're born and raised here and we live here, right? Um, Amrita should not be penalized because she just happened to be born on some very remote island in the middle of the South Pacific. Um, she should be able to have the same opportunities. Money might trickle down, power doesn't. And boy, do humanitarian organizations still don't get that. Invest in local leaders. That's really what we do at the, at the end of the day, is invest and believe in these local leaders. And let go of control and get out of the way. Give credit. Give ample credit. Give, give all the credit that everybody deserves, because ultimately it's not about you, it's not about we robotics, it's about colleagues like Amrita, who are the ones who are under the sun, flying these drones and making uh, a difference. And again, I go back to the, to the humble and kind, and you know, I, I, I'm far from the most humble and kind person on the planet, of course. Um, but I've just learned a lot of lessons, especially this year, in terms of interacting with colleagues and, and others that have just made me think, I just really want to, at the end of the day, I just want to work with, with kind people. Um, that's where I'm at in my life right now. Thank you very much, all. You've been very patient. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Patrick. And you had the words up there, give full credit. I think we can give full credit for a passionate team of people to come up with really innovative ways of bringing technology for uh, the people that need it most. And so let me invite you now to other people on the, on the stage. We're going to sit down here. There will be um, a few other examples that we'll give you. Come on, Ivana, and come on, uh, Giovanna, please. And then we'll also open up the conversation uh, to you, of course. Um, So let me maybe start with you, Ivana. Um, so Ivana works for UNHCR, so that for those who don't know, they, 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 they take care of, of refugees worldwide. Um, and uh, again, for those who, who, who don't know, we had actually the whole afternoon uh, in the other building of the, of the University of Virginia, but we had a, a workshop with experts from lots of NGOs about the use of drones and AI uh, in the humanitarian sector. And so you presented us with 
what an agency like US, UH, UNHCR could or would want to do with drones, but at the same time, you also had all these question marks that an organization like yours has. Do you want to share these two with us? Yes, sure. Um, OK, can everybody hear me? Yes. OK, so first of all, thank you very much for introduction and for the invite. Mm, yes, indeed, it was very interesting uh, talk this afternoon. And it had highlighted a lot of opportunities uh, that we could take in the future. So perhaps maybe I just start with uh, highlighting our problem and the challenges that we are facing. So we have started using the drones for the site planning. So for those of you who maybe are not familiar with the terms, it's maybe I put it in um, for planning of the refugee camps, uh, although right now we are using terminology settlements. And the challenges that we are facing are twofold. Uh, one, the land that we are given usually by the governments is not the prime land, meaning that a lot of times we are facing uh, hazards like flooding or landslides on this uh, land. And the other challenge that we are facing is the influx of the refugees that are coming in the emergency is very high. So we are facing sometimes several thousand people per day. And... Uh, we first uh, registered them at the reception center, and they stay there one or two days, and then we have to locate them in the settlement, meaning that we might have one or two days uh, to find them a housing solution. And this is where the drone comes in. It's for us, it's, it has been, we have uh, first started flying it in Bangladesh, and he, it has been very useful to be able to fly over the area, uh, to be able to do the analysis of terrain, of the land that we're given, um, and identify the hazards, or what we would like to do in the future, uh, identify topography of the land that we are given, and be able to already create roads and drainage, because these are our biggest, um, let's say, uh, issues that we need to first uh, address when we are doing a site plan, which in the years to come leads to less and less maintenance. Uh, now, when we're speaking a short-term solution, this may not come across a big issue, but average uh, camp, let's say li lifetime is 17 years. Now, if you imagine that you have to do a lot of repairs of the roads if they are not rightly positioned over 17 years, that is quite a lot of effort. Uh, with the drone technology and being able to identify the hazards in advance, it really reduces this uh, effort also for the maintenance. Um, and then another thing that we are facing in the camps, uh, the issue of flooding. Now, if, if we use just the satellite image, it gives us one snapshot in time and we we may be able to predict, if we have the data, where the flooding areas are. Uh, with the drone, we can, uh, let's say, we can do it as we need on weekly basis, on daily basis, and we can track also the movement of the water, and we can um, locate people accordingly uh, for them never to be actually placed in the flooding zone. So I, I hope this is, gives you at least a snapshot of uh, the issues and challenges that we are facing. Yeah, so imagine the challenge. You have thousands of people waiting out there. They need to be relocated in a matter of days in a terrain that is not good, uh, on which you probably don't have any maps, you don't have any analysis of toxicity or flooding or whatever. And what you are going to build is going to be their life place for maybe 15, 17 Yes, correct, years. yes. So you have very, very, very little time to build something for, for these people. And so drones, or actually what you can do with the drones, because it's not the flying thing itself that does the work, of course, uh, can help that. Maybe a transition to, to, to you, um, Giovanna. You, you're Giovanna De Marzo, you are, you're a professor in computer science here at the University of Geneva. 
what's the link of what you do with drones or AI in robotics? Okay, thank you for the transition and for the invitation. So maybe for those who don't know the Computer Science Center of the University of Geneva, it is um, an interfaculty center of uh, the university which gathers uh, uh, <clears throat> professors from different um, faculties and uh, we are all uh, detached to the, to the center and we all have um, computing, let's say, at heart. Uh, so, um, in, in relation to the, to the drones, uh, what we are currently working on, uh, on, on the research, we are working on, on uh, swarms of robots, so collective behavior of, of robots, and so there is a direct link to swarms of drones that could work collectively to solve together a complex tasks. So, the, the way we do it is that we take... Um, uh, inspiration from nature, like biology or like uh, school uh, f flocks of birds, and then we extract uh, uh, the essential mechanisms and we inject this into the robots or the drones. And so uh, this has a natural, let's say, uh, uh, in usage because then you can then make it more quickly uh, a collective mapping. And and the main idea is that. Um, the drones or the robots are working in an autonomous manner. So you just tell them a high-level task, let's say map uh, this area, and then they will do it on their own. They will self-organize and share themselves the, the mapping place. Um, in addition to this, we are also, um, let's say, once we are able to make these robots or drone work, the next step is to provide these swarms of robots as, as a service uh, so that other services or other, um, they, they can interact with, with other elements like other objects, connectors, captors, and so on. And, they, uh, and then if I have a need or someone has a need, then they can say, okay, who or how can you help me do this? And then there is a self, uh, let's say, spontaneous service arising from the drones and from other elements. So here we could imagine examples like um, where you, you could have a, a drone helping connecting people with internet connection, or we could have um, uh, delivering uh, uh, goods or drugs, or so um, providing a rescue route for uh, services, but then also coordinating this with other services. And this is also point raised before by, mm -hmm. by Patrick. Mm -hmm. So that's for the moment in, in the terms of, let's say, drones and, and robotics. Mm -hmm. So in, in a way, you're, you're hoping to have that box full of mosquitoes, but instead you will have your micro drones in there and you will release them and then they would self-organize to do whatever task you yes. want them to do. Is that yes. the idea? Yes, yeah. that's, that's the idea. So mm -hmm. uh, first, each drone is working autonomously, so there would be no person driving the drone and together they work collectively so they have not they must not bump into each other but they also need to coordinate their tasks so they are not for instance mapping twice the same area so that's that's the main idea and providing them as a service so what sort of in intelligence in quotation marks do you do you embark in that is that all in the machines themselves or is there sort of a central brain that still feeds them? That, that, that's a very good question. The, the main driving idea is to have no central brain. So the idea is that everything is decentralized, so every drone or robot has its own local, let's say, intelligence and, and local um, knowledge of local areas, and then they communicate locally to do this is more complex and emergent uh, behavior all together, which makes them also appealing because if you are in a disaster area, then you may have no longer any infrastructure and they can build on their own the, the necessary communications uh, through the algorithms and so on. Patrick, do you already see applications for swarms of drones instead of swarms of mosquitoes? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I felt like I've talked too much, so I'll keep it really short. Uh, we actually tested, a, there was a British startup uh, this summer that joined us in Switzerland, 
um, to basically test a swarming software for, for drones. So we had five drones in the air, and then we said, okay, we want this and this mapped, and then the drones themselves decide who will do what part of the mapping and who comes back to get a new battery and, and so on. And for, for us, uh, for sure, I mean, we could either do five flights with one drone um, and uh, take all that time, or we can do uh, one flight with five drones and get done and finished with and move on to whatever next uh, task there, there is. So uh, we're waiting for affordable, reliable uh, swarming software, hint, hint, um, that we could uh, uh, share with our flying labs and that they could apply as needed uh, in the work that they do. Maybe back to, to you, Ivana. So you'd, you'd like to have these instruments work for you, but I mean, not, none in, at UNHCR is, is about drones themselves. So would you like to have them just do the work sort of autonom autonomously? And, and what would be your, um, your minimum requirements, actually, on a system like that? For the drones, uh, I think it would be brilliant if we could have a drone that we can just set, um, send up in the air and uh, have a map in, I don't know, 20 minutes, an hour, two hours. Uh, the biggest challenge that we have now is also the processing time. Uh, so it is not just so much about the flying, but the processing of the images and also what you do with the image. So yes, if there are applications, uh, that could do that quite easily, this would be uh, a great help for our work. So, so what would be your wish list, if you could make a Christmas the, wish list for...? The, for the drone mapping, uh, first the good quality images, then uh, the analysis of the flooding area, of the slopes, of the topography, uh, then it would be great to have application that would possibly even predict where to put the roads, even if then we amend them ourselves. But definitely the um, landslides and the flooding mapping, that would already be, already be a great step. She, she, on the way to here, uh, Ivana told me, we had that conversation about how, how good does the result have to be to be meaningful, you know, and it was very interesting. If, if, if your drones are actually looking for missing people, you want to have sort of 99.9% .9 uh, precision, of course, because you want to find the person. H how much percent precision do you need when you plan? It's kind of hard to say, let's say, uh, exact figure, but I would say in the emergency, even if you get maybe 90, 85% accuracy, this would already be great. And uh, when we are <clears throat> doing the planning, if we understand that we are not getting 99% accuracy, we can work with buffer zone. For instance, if we know that the flooding area is to a certain point, and we know the accuracy is maybe 90%, not 99%, we can add a little bit higher uh, buffer zone. And this, this would still mean that, um, we would not be putting people at risk if we settled them there. Coming back to you, because you, you are the researcher in the room, <laughs> um, and, and this afternoon, just for your information, it was actually mostly NGOs, uh, and, and, and there were only a few scientists that were working on, on the AI, on the image recognition and all that, uh, and I think that one of the questions that came up very often is we, we don't really have the scientific knowledge yet as an NGO to deal with it. But what other type of questions did you hear from, from the humanitarian sector this afternoon to the scientific community? We are finally in a university here. I think one of, one of the questions was this, um, how to go from 98% up to 99.9%, yeah. which can be difficult or could be uh, done with also maybe crowd sourcing uh, additional help from from the crowds. Um, wh what I think in terms of what what would be great to do for for the future, or um, for progressing going further, is uh, to to build kind of teams of interdisciplinary people and not only researchers but also together with all people involved and uh, to, to, to work on some specific uh, uh, problems. So for instance, if I look at how we work together today, 
we, we are trying to anticipate uh, needs for, for usage and so on, but it will be much more um, impactful if, if we really work with uh, the, the right people, with the right uh, problem. And so uh, we, we would be ready to, to, to do this type of things. And I think the, the solution goes through interdisciplinary uh, work all, all together. Before I give, I give the floor to the room, uh, did, did you hear any questions that surprised you this afternoon, Patrick? Questions that surprised me? Uh, yes, um, the head of the innovation unit for the ICRC uh, asking about, you know, uh, are there, is there guidance on how to work with these startup companies that I just mentioned, for example? Um, and I thought that was an incredibly, uh, I haven't heard that question uh, anywhere near enough, and clearly she's She's in the know and, 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 and really, um, really uh, has her pulse on the finger because that's been such a huge problem uh, for us. And so I was very, very uh, super, super impressed. She's clearly uh, very experienced. Um, so it was great to get that question. It's, it's, those are the hard questions. That's the reality when you're out there in the field. And if you don't partner with the right uh, group from the private sector, it can, uh, it can create harm very, very clearly. So. Yeah, I think personally that, we, that it's the right place to have that conversation also in the university because we have to ask ourselves the questions of what are the social, societal implications of these technologies that we put out there. Here we're talking about the good things, you know, but, but of course the same drone that, that analyzes your, your flooding lines could also analyze other stuff. Uh, and especially I think in, in, in refugees, you know, that's, that's a big debate. You know, how, how far do you go in mapping you know, refugee flows? Uh, and and how, how do you share the data and how do you make sure it doesn't fall in the wrong hands? Uh, is that an issue for you as well? Yes, that would definitely be uh, an issue. So, yes, co confidentiality and sharing of data is important issues that uh, I think this was also spoken, touched upon this afternoon, and it's a very important subject, um, and especially with the refugee flows, yes. So you see we're in that phase where there's an immense enthusiasm, I think, about the potential of that. And sometimes the, 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 the enthusiasm is just faster as, as, the, as, the, as the thoughts, or at least the, the, the knowledge about codes of conduct and things like that. So how enthusiastic are you about asking questions? Yes, there is one enthusiast over here and another one over there, I see that. Please. Thank you very much. It's, uh very exciting listening to you. My name is Pascal Porsche from the International Committee of the Red Cross. Um, my question, what I would like to hear from the panel, is uh, where you see the potential for the predictive use of, uh, of this uh, drone imagery and probably aerial imagery uh, to predict where the disasters are going to happen so that the response is, is not just very fast, but probably there before something happens. Okay, so in terms of uh, analysis of, of data, uh, you, you have uh, these three elements, which is one, you analyze the, the existence, or you can make predictions, and then you can make prescriptions in the sense that uh, uh, prediction is uh, you, you, you take current data, and then you, you we, with existing uh, history, you can anticipate whether something is going to happen. And then the prescription is uh, going the step further, which is knowing the prediction, what would be the best course of action to take to either curb the prediction or anticipate what is best to do. So, I mean, uh, so, some techniques to analyze data uh, in terms of uh, machine learning, data mining, and so on, already exist. Here, the challenge is sometimes that it's on, on images. Uh, so this means you have to maybe recognize uh, patterns of changes in images, and not only on numbers or, or values. But um, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert in this data analysis, but uh, I'm pretty confident that all this is going to be done. So. Um, uh, there is a lot in computer vision, analysis of, of images. So in terms of what, what you are mentioning, if you, let's say, send drones regularly, maybe you can start 
uh, say, seeing the, the landslide, and then you can already anticipate signs, but you have to recognize them and maybe know them in advance so you can recognize. And, and there's, of course, a, a, basic, a basic thing that many countries in the world don't, don't have. It's just the really basic knowledge of their terrain. Uh, and, and that's the picture that you showed with that woman, you know, that throws the, the drone. I mean, the, the, the start to any type of remediation or, or, or prevention is, is just knowing what you even have. What, what are the assets in terms of, of your geography out there? And I think that, that is a, a technology that is game changer for, for lots and lots of lots of countries, you know. Please, there's a question in the front there. Thank you very much. I'm Marco Sassoli. I teach international law at the university, but previously I worked in the humanitarian field, and I must say I would have loved to have drones, but there were no drones at that time. Um, just one point I wonder, many, not astonishingly many humanitarian crises occur in places where the authorities, but also the people, are sceptical or even um, have uh, all kind of fears and uh, paranoid about spies, about even being attacked by drones. And unfortunately, as you know, there are drones which are used for attacking people. How could you overcome that? Uh, say, identify the drones which work for humanitarian, uh, distinguish them, create trust among the populations and among the authorities that this is a totally different thing, although they look very much like the other drones. Do you want to take it? Thank you for the questions. I think uh, it's a very good question, actually, and it is very challenging to be accepted by the government. And I think this is where we will face also a big, um, let's say, a challenge on uh, how to get governments to allow us to fly. We are not at the stage where we systematically negotiate with the governments because we are only starting to use the drone. But I think what we can do to increase let's say, acceptance of the governments is to include them in our plans and for them also to see the benefit of what we are doing with the drones. Now, in the countries where they do not have maps or satellite images of the certain areas, it is something that maybe they can benefit of as well. And if we can train them as well, and I'm speaking from our perspective, where in some cases we are working not only in conflict zones, but in the governments that are host governments for the refugees, which makes it a little bit easier to negotiate I would imagine. Um, so if we maybe train people from the government so they feel included and if we are transparent on what we are doing uh, with the drones, why they're used, uh, I would imagine that would uh, maybe give us uh, a bit more of a space to start working with the governments. Would you like to? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. I think this is where the, the code of conduct comes in uh, again. It's really surprising when we talk to donors about the kind of projects and activities that the Flying Labs do. You know, they think that, oh, community engagement, you're just doing it in two hours. And it, you know, why do you even have a line item in your budget for community engagement? Um, you know, and this is where we have to educate our, our donors a, a little bit. Say, no, no, this is actually fundamental to everything that the Flying Labs do is following this code of conduct to engage with local communities. Um, and it's important to note that when this happens, any of the labs, let's say in Tanzania, it's not Patrick who's going to a rural community, I don't speak a word of Swahili, uh, saying, hey guys, check out my drone, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. Uh, no, it's Gati and Leka and Yusuf, Tanzanians, who are going to these remote communities, and they don't start out by showing the drones. 
um, different cultures, different regions will have different ways of asking for permission and so on. I sat down at a, a traditional ceremony in Fiji with elders, go through a couple hours of sitting down, eating, talking, going through a ritual to build that trust, to, to share you know, what it is um, the Tanzania Flying Labs would like to do with their permission. And then they explain how the drones work and how they've been used elsewhere. And then maybe after day two or three or four, here is the technology, this is how it works, and so on, right? That, that, that takes time, and it's important. You know, again, we're guests in, in, in flying labs themselves are guests in those communities. And, and sometimes, like has happened uh, during some of the cargo drone delivery work in, uh, in, in the Amazon, you know, we wanted to ask this local community whether we could take off and land from their village, and they said no, and that was... That was it. I mean, we're not going to argue with that, and we found another place, you know? So um, it's because of that community engagement and the direct Tanzanians talking to Tanzanians um, that I think the Flying Labs are able to do uh, what they do. And don't get me wrong, there are many more bad ways to do community engagement than there are good ways. Uh, I'd like to think that our Flying Labs are showing uh, a pretty good model uh, where there's respect um, and integrity and... Um, yeah, differing to local communities. But, but your question is a really good one. We had actually a somewhat similar um, meeting in, in Boston a few months ago, and, and someone in the room said, well, if you fly a big airplane, you can paint the Red Cross on it. If you drive a big truck, you can. If you paint it on, on a drone, nobody's going to see it. So, so that, I mean, it's, re it's really an issue, and so there might be also some other things that we have to think about, like, like air traffic control. Of course, often in the places where, where the crisis hits, there, there is no infrastructure. But it's a very good question. I don't think there is a real solution. Or if someone has the solution in the room, please just raise your hand. No, OK, so then, you, so then you, it's your turn to come up with a question, I guess. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bob McCarthy. I'm from UNICEF. Uh, and I'm sorry I missed the program in the afternoon. Uh, my colleague, uh, B.P. Panwar, was here, who's our techni technology for development uh, regional specialist, um, and may have shared that we're presently working with the government in Kazakhstan and uh, a regional uh, body in Almaty uh, trying to um, see how drone technology and humanitarian response can be piloted and its uh, merits demonstrated. Uh, so we're hoping that that will demonstrate some progress that would be to the benefit of governments and the humanitarian community. But my question is, maybe it is for um, Patrick and Ivana. I'm curious because the, the humanitarian community has been criticized for not being sufficiently comprehensive and objective in needs assessments. Uh, and it's recognized we need to be much better at that. Uh, so I'm curious, in terms of what you've seen over the years, I mean, Patrick, maybe going back to Nepal, um, how the, um, the agencies, and, and then Ivana from UNHCR's standpoint, how is drone technology being um, sort of mainstreamed or applied into assessment methodology as an instrument of assessment? Do you see progress being made, more acceptance? I mean. Again, from the UNICEF standpoint, I, I think we need to look at this very seriously. So I'm interested in your, uh, what you can share on that. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, well, actually, we only started using the drone this year. Uh, so it's a very embryotic stage of the use of drone. And a lot of questions that you have raised, we are also internally raising. Now, in terms of the needs assessment, we have used it in Bangladesh uh, after the monsoon started, when we started uh, getting flash floodings. We have used a uh, drone um, to do the initial assessment. So we flew over the uh, areas and the uh, more strategic points like roads, the bridges, to make sure that um, they're passable, and we deployed. We already had uh, teams in place to be deployed uh, to do the local um, work um, to correct, um, repair the damages. In terms of streamlining in the organizations, 
we are starting the internal discussions. So we are hoping that uh, our department is taking the lead. Uh, I, I cannot say with great certainties, uh, let's say the way forward, but uh, the discussions have started and uh, because we have started using it for the site planning, uh, I, we are going towards our department taking the lead. And I think with us starting to use it, also different sections are starting to see the benefits and the importance of using the drone. And I think this is um, probably in the next year or two, uh, it's going to be more and more used also for the uh, needs assessment. So, that's a really great question. I haven't, I haven't, it would be, I, I can't wait to see the day where this is all integrated and and mainstream, that it would be phenomenal. And by the way, just to uh, kudos to UNICEF, we, we had the opportunity to work with UNICEF Malawi uh, last year, and what a phenomenal team, and the, the, the partners, uh, Malawian partners they brought together for the trainings that we, 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 uh, we've been given to different UN agencies and so on, it was just one of the best trainings that I've ever been a part of, and that was really uh, because of the relationship, the trust that they've developed with the local community disaster management, uh, organizations and national and so on. It was just phenomenal. And of course, you know, they have a drone corridor and they really, it's really helped us uh, and the flying labs around the world saying, hey, you know, look what's going on in Malawi. Uh, this is possible. This is, this is real. Uh, so just wanted to say it's great, great work that UNICEF has been doing. Are there any other questions? Oh, yeah, over there and then one over there. Right, thank you for the presentation. Um, I was wondering if we are in, into a situation of conflicts, is there any projects with the ICR, ICRC to work in collaboration with uh, some platforms like yours with robotics to develop a platform when you can have the location of any drones into a country in a conflict? And if you have the location, then you can maybe may make the difference between the drone of the army and the drone of humanitarian assistance. Like, maybe the fact that the ICRC is always working with state, it can make the, the way easy for you to have the authorization to, to fly into this country. Is anyone from ICRC here that can answer the question? Yeah, the gentleman over there. We come back to you with a question afterwards. Yeah, thank you very much. It's, it's a great question, but it's also a, a really great challenge for us, uh, as it was uh, said before. And we, we are struggling with, of course, the very same uh, issues as UNHCR and all the others are struggling. Um, I, th I think what, what is happening here is that we as humanitarians, we need to recognize that we are at the moment of in incremental change. and, and we as humanitarians need therefore also to adjust our mindset and to start reflecting about precisely these issues and, and that's the reason why I'm here. Um, we, we, we do have teams that are working in the drone lab as, as the colleagues from the United Nations are doing as, as well. We're also working with uh, people that uh, develop these uh, AI uh, software applications so to make the use of, of that. But where we really need to get off the ground is when it comes to uh, discussing with the stakeholders and, and working on the acceptance, uh, and we are certainly not yet there. But uh, I think your idea is certainly a good one. In the back there, please. Yeah, it's a question about regulation and mainly to Patrick, uh, his experience with governments. What are the main hurdles, the main reluctance from the governments uh, so that they accept drones to be flying in the country, especially in disaster or reconstruction work? And, you know, according to your experience, what, you know, what needs to be done so that it's better accepted? Let's say thanks for raising that, um, the, uh, those questions. The regulations is uh, still, I think, the, the most difficult um, challenge that, that we face. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that um, it's unsurmountable, but it does take time. I think where we have been somewhat more fortunate maybe than, than other organizations and so on is 
uh, because it's again not myself or Sonia that's trying to convince the Civil Aviation Authority of Nepal to provide Nepal Flying Labs with flight permissions. It'll be Utam and Pradeep. And I still remember this um, situation where you know, we, we have a business incubation program uh, at, at uh, We Robotics at Sonia, that Sonia runs to help build, uh, incubate local drone businesses uh, in, in different countries. And Sonia <clears throat> was running a training in, in Nepal to help train, uh, in, help incubate these, these uh, different uh, uh, businesses. And you know, they invited two, uh, one or two officials from the Civil Aviation Authority, from the Nepali Civil Aviation Authority, to come and present to these young entrepreneurs what the regulations are in Nepal. And I just love this story because when, when, when these officials finished telling them everything that they couldn't do, uh, these uh, Nepalis said, what the heck are you guys talking about? Don't you, you, you've seen what we've been trying to do over the past two days. We're putting our business plans together, our pitches, our marketing, our fundraising, our use cases. We want to create these businesses to improve humanitarian efforts, development, and so on, and you bastards, you have just told us that basically we've got no chance in hell of setting up our own, our own businesses here. What, what, what the heck, you know? And, uh, and to the credit of the aviation authority officials, they, they said, you know, you have a point. Um, we have to find a way to work with you and to enable you as young entrepreneurs to follow your dreams and, and, and make Nepal a success story with the use of emerging technologies and so on. That conversation could have never happened if Sonia and I were part of that conversation, right? It's really when you localize that and you let people advocate for themselves, right? And to say, hey, this is, this is not okay with us, you know? Now, not all aviation authorities are gonna be that enlightened, um, but what we have found is the best way to help uh, these flying labs convince the CEAs to pay attention is to show them, show the CEAs what the other labs have already done in other countries. And so you say to the Peruvian government, like, well, look what are they, look what are they doing in Tanzania. They, they figured it out in Tanzania, what's wrong with Peru? Like, you've got universities, you're educated, you've got ministries, why can't you do it in Peru? Like, you know, and yeah, it's a bit cheeky on our part, but, um, but it's true, you know, when you show them drones flying in, uh, in the Pacific and we ask the Filipinos, like, What's happening, in, what's happening in Fiji? What's wrong with the Philippines? You know, that, that's more powerful than, than trying to come up with other arguments, honestly. So, I don't know if that really answers your question. You want to add anything? Because I know it's, it's a challenge. Do you want to add something about it? Uh, no, it's, uh, it's the, I, I think you summarized it very well. I think you uh, explained very well. And you have a lot more experience than us because we are just starting to use the drones. And it's definitely a big challenge. So... I think you have a lot more experience in that. The labs, yeah. yeah. So we want to be mindful also of, of your evening and your time, and it's not if we close the conversation here that we disappear and you can continue the conversation. So I was just, I just wanted to recognize you know, the role of the Geneva Science and Policy Interface in, in bringing these various organizations together. It's something that hasn't been done too much so far. And I think uh, it became pretty obvious this afternoon, Nicola, that there was a great need for for continuing and deepening also some of these conversations. It's sometimes, you know, the, when you're not on the same floor, you don't even know what the people do on the other side. And, and that's, that, that's where some of the magic can happen. I want to thank also very much our distinguished panel. Thank you very much, uh, Giovanna, Ivana, and, and Patrick. And uh, well, be, be safe, be kind. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening.